Welcome to our webinar. In these text talks, we look to share exciting, industry-relevant topics happening here at UT Austin and the Cockrell School of Engineering. We hope to bring you both cutting-edge faculty research updates and, like today, informed perspectives of our industry experts. If this is the first time you're joining a text talk, the format is the following. I'll introduce our speaker. He'll present for about 40 minutes. As Javier mentioned, as you think of them, please type your questions in the Q&A window on the right of your screen. At the end of the text talk, we'll have time to address your questions. Our speaker today, Rick Bobigan, is the president and managing member of companies 1776 Energy and 1836 Resources, as well as a board of advisors member, instructor, and author for PTEX, the University of Texas at Austin's Petroleum Extension. Both 1776 Energy and 1836 Resources specialize in the upstream sector of the oil and gas industry, specifically in horizontal well drilling mainly in the Eagleford Shale, with a focus on operations to optimize production. As I mentioned, while leading these two companies, Rick also teaches in several courses, including P-Texas Fundamentals of Petroleum and Rig School, our Introduction to off Offshore Operations course. His career and corner office perspective truly enhance the economics and investment decision-making portions of those courses. Rick graduated from the Colorado School of Mines as a geological engineer. Upon graduation, he joined Texaco in South Louisiana and took on the role of a staff engineer. We're grateful to have such a distinguished, knowledgeable industry leader and dedicated PTEX instructor join us today. Rick is a person whose counsel and perspective I value. I think you will too. Rick, thank you very much for your text talk today. Handing off to you. Okay. Well, Dr. Rowe, thank you very much for that introduction, and I'm grateful for being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this interesting topic, which we have today. And, and the topic is, when will the price of oil return to pre-pandemic rates? And I originally want to talk about, will the price of oil return to pre-pandemic rates? A much easier topic. But Savannah Taylor talked me into saying we should talk about when will. And therefore, that requires prediction. So in any prediction, there's two parts. There's the actual prediction itself. Will the prices return to pre-pandemic levels? And then secondly, there's the most difficult part, which is when. So what I hope to accomplish today is, a, is talking about, yes, will prices return to pre-pandemic levels? Absolutely. When will prices do it? Well, we'll talk about that towards the end of the talk. I have a lot of material I want to cover before that, but before I do, I'm amazed at how many, uh, how much help it takes to put these talks on. I'd like to thank Dr. Rowe for the invitation. Uh, Savannah Taylor, who I mentioned, has been very important in marketing and coordinating for me. Canavis uh, Smith has been very instrumental since I think this is his project, since he's the, uh, Business Director for the Texas Engineering Education Program, that's uh, Executive Education that's offered. And then the star of the show, of course, is Javier Modomina, who has the one that's responsible for putting this all together. And he and I know how much work that has taken, so I really appreciate everyone. Uh, lastly, I have a couple people from my team. I'd like to thank Travis Michael, Rosie Valdez, and Richard White for helping me get all the technical difficulties and technical side of it done. So now our talk, when will the price of crude oil return to pre-pandemic rates? I, in putting this talk together, I had to put some original material together. So what you'll see is some original material, and then you'll see material that's uh, available through the Energy Information Administration, which is available through the uh, US government. But I've broken it down into two parts. I've broken it down into what I call the big picture and then the, the little picture. So the big picture in my definition is going to be energy demand in general on a worldwide basis. So we'll start off making some points about that. And then once we cover that energy in general on a worldwide basis, then we'll talk about the specific aspects of the pandemic and what effect it's had on prices and in general, what effects it's had on uh, energy, but also specifically on crude oil, since that's the main topic of today. So that's the topic, big picture, little picture, and what we intend to accomplish that. So on 
total energy worldwide price, supply, demand, and business cycles. Those are four components of the energy system. And just to give you some highlights about that, energy has grown between 1.1% and 1.5% over the last 50, 60, 75 years. So energy is going to grow no matter what. The demand for energy is going to grow no matter what because population grows. So the, the driver and the energy demand is the growth in population, which is about 1.1%, particularly into the future. Now, why is that important? Because without those consumers who are using every conceivable device that requires electricity, heat, or fuels, those are where, where the uh, demand is. On the supply side, cement supply historically has grown to equal demand. There's ups and downs on the supply side, there's disruptions, there's uh, timing differences, there's a number of other factors that enter into the supply side. But we, one thing about the supply side is, is we know that demand is going to grow at about 1% per year. Oftentimes on the supply side, we overshoot, we make too much investment, we create too much supply of energy, and it takes a while for demand to catch up to that oversupply. That adjustment period is called the business cycle. And what typically adjusts during that period of time is price. So this is setting the stage for what happened with COVID and 2020. But I want to tell a little formula that I like to use, and that is in any economic system, you start off with equilibrium. That means supply and demand are in balance, and supply is the meeting the demand at some price. Whenever there's a disruption, a change, a change in demand or an oversupply or not enough supply, then there's a disequilibrium where they're not in balance. And when they're not in balance, then there's an adjustment. And typically what happens, either supply is too much, then price adjusts, and then demand adjusts accordingly. Or if there's uh, not enough demand or too much demand, then price adjusts and then supply adjusts accordingly. Well, the length of time it takes for that adjustment to occur, it's always looking for a new equilibrium. So you start off with equilibrium, demand goes down, supply price goes down, supply goes down, and then we hit an equilibrium. Once we hit that equilibrium, then any change will cause it to reoccur. So in this particular case, demand will go up, price will go up, supply will go up, and then we'll seek a new equilibrium. So that creates the business cycle. And what we're going to talk about today as part of our text is how long is the business cycle associated with COVID and, and these stay at home policies and the things we've talked about so far. OK, so. Commodity prices are always the price of oil, the price of electricity, the price of uh, energy in general are always a leading indicator. And they usually are anticipatory. So a price will move even though supply and demand are adjusting. Price will move either up or down according to what the conditions are. So that is a really good short term indicator. Whenever there's disruptions, they tend to generally be short term and I'm talking about disruptions to energy. There's some war, there's some insurrection, there's some terrorism. There's a weather issue. There's a number of other things that can go on in the world. There's a financial situation that will ultimately affect demand and supply will adjust to that. But what happens is supply adjusts, demand continues to grow. And then demand adjusts to try to meet, meet the supply. I mean, supply adjusts to try to meet the demand. Uh, another thing that I'd like to uh, put out here is that technology and innovation are the keys to the future demand for energy in general, worldwide demand. As we approach different issues, climate change, uh, the green policies to try to get away from uh, putting uh, methane and CO2 into the atmosphere, all those different changes that governments are trying to adjust to, uh, those are going to spur technology and then that technology will help us provide the proper demand and proper and proper supply to meet the demand. So just a word about the green energy policies and the climate change 
they will drive the change, but no matter what, the population is going to uh, continue to demand energy from all sources. So Javier, would you put up the first slide, please? What you're looking at here is a slide that is world total energy consumption. And the premise of this, if it was consumed, it was produced and supply met demand and at some price. We'll talk about price in the next couple of slides. But what I want you to look at here, the top line, is, black line, is petroleum and liquids. And that's what we're ultimately going to talk about in the little picture. But I wanted you to see the relationship of crude oil and liquids associated, natural gas liquids that are produced by, are supplied by suppliers, that that's the curve from 2010 into the future. And then the other part I want you to look at is that you notice the, the there, on the right hand side there's renewables, which are in green. Then there's natural gas, which is in blue. There's coal, which is in black. And then down towards the bottom is nuclear. Those are basically the five components that make up the, the sources that create energy and deliver energy to customers. So. Looking at that curve, you'll see that oil is by far the dominant product, and it's about 31% of the total energy mix. If you look at 2020, there's a line that goes, a vertical line that goes through 2020, and then you'll see a box that says 208 quadrillion BTU, and that, that is equal to about 98 million barrels of oil per day. So, Oil's contribution to the total energy mix is about 98 million barrels per day. And then you can look down that vertical line and you can see that coal is the next most, uh, next largest contributor. Below that is natural gas, below that is renewables, and below that is nuclear. And if you look at the lines moving from left to right, you'll see that crude oil, coal and natural gas have a fairly predictable forward projection out to 2050. Renewables are the ones that are moving from left to right. They're growing at a much faster rate than everything. And that should fit with what you think about what's going on in today's economy about the energy mix. So what goes on in that? And then you can see nuclear is, is pretty flat. And nuclear has been affected recently by weather conditions and the events that, that happened in Japan where they lost some of their nuclear plants during the, one of their typhoons and the flooding that went with it. So Japan is moving, has made a policy to move from nuclear to move to fossil fuels or some other source to make electricity. So that's the future look where we are today. We've got the energy mix and you can see the crude oil's on top, coal, natural gas, renewables, and nuclear. So now I want to move from that to on um, part of the big pictures. I want to slide into crude because crude oil is used primarily to make fuels, fuels of all type, whether it's distillate, diesel, gasoline, jet fuel, what, whatever it is. And it, so therefore, crude oil is used primarily to make fuel for transportation. And you'll see that that's uh, the major impact that has affected the price of crude oil as we get into the little picture. So a couple of takeaways that I want you to take from this, though, even though crude has been affected, crude is still 31% of the energy mix, but long term crude is going to continue, as you saw in that prior slide, crude is going to continue to have a major role in energy for this foreseeable future. Because as long as we have internal combustion engines, then we're going to need some kind of fuel. And right now, the best fuels or the most cost effective fuels come from crude oil. Even though they feed transportation and transportation is being affected by electric vehicles, electric vehicles are going to make an impact, but they're certainly not going to dominate the amount of vehicles. There's, I think, 1.5 
trillion vehicles in the market, and the growth is supposed to be somewhere around 2.4 going into the future. Okay, I've already mentioned that crude oil is 31% of the growth, and the future, if you look at the, the graph that's up on the screen, the crude oil is going to continue to grow in the future. Right now, it's about 94 million barrels a day to 98 million barrels a day, which I showed on the graph. It's going to grow to somewhere about 110 million barrels of oil to, per day in the future. So therefore, because crude oil is a depleting resource, and what that means is as we produce it, it's being removed from the earth, extracted from the earth, and it's not being replaced, at least in uh, human time. Geologic time, it might be replaced, but none of us are going to be here at that particular time. So in the human time, it's being extracted, it's being consumed, and so it's a depleting resource. So in the world of crude oil, prior to this time, there was always a discussion about peak oil. Are we going to get to the point where we find all the oil and produce all the oil we can, and then it's going to start declining because of diminishing returns, which means it's too costly to, to get. And what's changed all that is a little bit of technology and what's happened in the last 10 or 12 years is horizontal drilling and horizontal drilling has allowed us to take known reserves and convert them to producing reserves which has really helped the energy mix so crude oil is going to be here for a long time it's going to get out to maybe 110 million barrels a day and the question always was if the demand is there will the supply be there and i, I think with the latest technology supply is going to be there now there is a price where supply is not going to be created. So to typically crude oil, 98% of crude oil, crude oil requires a well to produce. So someone has to drill a well, make the investment to drill a well. Someone has to equip it, put it on production. It has to go into a market and that market has to transfer it to a refiner. The refiner has to take the crude oil as a raw material and make it into products and then those products get delivered to consumers. Consumers cannot use crude oil as it is. So the relationship between producers and buyers of crude oil, producers are majorly, basically large to medium size, publicly traded or independent to even small independents that spend the capital to drill a well and put a well on production sell that production to a buyer and the buyer is generally a refiner and that's important to note buyers of crude oil are sophisticated multinational uh, very large companies with large teams of people who do nothing but try to predict what the future is going to be and then on top of that in the crude oil world you also have uh, investors that like to buy crude oil contracts and either rise with the price or uh, make money by holding crude oil contracts. And I looked yesterday, there's about 169 million barrels of contracts outstanding at this particular time that are held by investors. And these are usually, these are thousand barrel contracts that you can trade on the futures market. But what's important about what I'm gonna say about price, just about everyone that's in the business of creating new supply, which is drilling wells and producing wells, needs about $55 per barrel of oil to cause the investment to make. Any price lesser than $55 a barrel, that discourages new developments because we're just not going to drill wells that don't make money. It doesn't make sense to invest and then not get your money back and a rate of return. So the magic number for oil today with the cost of goods and services, the cost of the investment, and what it takes to produce and sell oil is around $55 per barrel. The price of oil today is somewhere around 39 or 41, depending on what index you're looking at. And I'm talking about West Texas Intermediate. Brent crude is usually two or three dollars more than that. So it would be up in the 40 to 45 dollars a barrel. But that's still not enough to cause new development. So what's going on in the supply creation side of the business with oil being less than 55 dollars a barrel, companies are doing a lot less supply creation. They're only doing what they have to do. And uh, as a result, they're drilling the best projects and they're only doing what they have to do. So that's really critical to going forward. There has to be a price of oil that will encourage new supplies to be created. Because if it doesn't, when demand finally picks back up post-COVID, 
then will the supply be there to meet the demand? And we'll talk about that again, like I say, in, in the little picture. Uh, so I'd like to go to the next slide, please, Javier. Okay, I just want to take just a minute and talk about the relationship of the, the products we just talked about. On this graph, you can see that crude oil is on the left and it's used, to, it's a fuel used for transportation. And then you look to the right and you see four sources of, of fuels that are used to generate electricity and heat. And that, of course, is natural gas and coal. And then you have renewables and then you have nuclear, which we just mentioned in the previous slide. The arrows that are on the front of these columns are indicating the general trend of that sector. So crude oil is declining worldwide slightly, the, the demand for it. Natural grass, gas is growing in a worldwide basis. Coal is declining, mainly in the industrialized countries, but everywhere else in the world, coal is still used to, to run a generator to make the to power a generator to make electricity. And then renewables are really growing. And renewables, of course, are the wind, the solar, the biomass, and uh, uh, water that are used to, to make electricity. And then we mentioned nuclear, which, which has a place. Right. So the fastest growing segment of the electrical generation business is in the renewables. The cost of renewables is not as attractive as using a fossil fuel, which is net natural gas and coal. So as a result, there's still a large amount of product being used to make electricity that are hydrocarbon bearing. You tie that with climate change and you tie that with the, the uh, trying to clean up the atmosphere or put less CO2 into the atmos atmosphere or less greenhouse gases, then there's a constant struggle back and forth. But what at the end of the day, what really pulls the struggle is the demand of, of the population, the, the worldwide population to have energy. So as long as that demand is there for the population, then producers are going to do the best they can to to meet that demand. OK. OK, and the last thing I, I want to do before I move into the little picture is setting up a background is again, talk about this relationship in a business cycle. So as prices go up, supply will go up. Demand will go down. As prices go down for the commodity, demand will go up and supply will go down. And that relationship is, is what creates the business cycle. The length of time for those changes is what we're going to talk about when we get into the little picture. So Harvey, would you go to the next slide, please? You can't talk about oil without talking about a price. So what I put up here is the price of oil from 2010 to present, and you can see it's a wild ride. Uh, the, on the right hand side is the price of oil in dollars per barrel, and then on the bottom scale is the time. And these are just monthly totals, monthly averages for price as they trade on the NYMEX. There's all kinds of indexes that you can look at, but the NYMEX is the easiest to look at. Everybody kind of knows what it is. So if you work from left to right, you can see there was a general trend of rising prices from 2010 to 2000, mid-2014. Then in mid-2014, the price of oil declined very rapidly, very quickly, until about 2005, late 2015. And then it started back, moving again to the right, it started back up to where it got up to a, a high 60s and the 70s. And then we had a decline. So what you see are the two numbers to the right, $58 per barrel and then $39 per barrel. The $58 per barrel is the target for 2019. That's the average price. And that when we get to the little picture of world prices return to pre-pandemic, that's our target. Even though if you look historically, the price of oil has been a lot higher. But what caused the current drop in prices was due to a rapid drop in demand. That rapid drop in demand caused the suppliers to have to adjust. And in between the price adjusted downward, which forces the, the suppliers to stop creating new supply. 
So in looking at the, well, the prices rise, $58 a barrel is the target. So we're currently at 39 to 41, depending on what you look at. I looked this morning and the December futures price is 41.32, just to give you some example. So our target is in that discussion, are we gonna get back up to $58 a barrel? Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide that I like to use because it's, it gives an overview over a very long period of time. It's from the 1950s to 2025, so it's a 75 year look. And the top curve is the population curve. It's in blue, and you can see that going from left to right, population has grown from uh, two and a half billion people to where it's about 7.7 .7 billion people today. And that's just over that. 70, uh, 75 years, or not quite 75 years. So that curve is pretty smooth. There's not a lot of changes to it. It's pretty predictable. And when you equate the consumption of, of energy of all sources, whether it's energy or food or tangible goods or whatever the, whatever the product is, more people will want more. And they'll, therefore, the, the market gets bigger. And so it's real fundamental to say that the demand for energy of all sources, whether it's electricity or it's heat or it's a motor fuel, is going to pretty much follow the growth of the population. So that's at 1.1%. Now, my curiosity always was how did demand for products for energy change as the population grew steadily? It, it's not a smooth ride for the supply creators. So why do we have so many ups and downs? And it's generally creating too much or not enough on the supply side, because we either overshoot expectations of what we think demand's gonna be, or we undershoot it. And, but the controller other is that is usually the price. So we just talked about price, and what are we gonna talk about with this red curve is this is energy consumption from all sources. That's nuclear, renewables, coal, natural gas, and oil converted to barrels of oil. And you can see that that curve generally follows the curve of population, but it's not a smooth curve like population. So I've circled two places on there that I want to draw your attention to. The first one is in the 1980 to 1986 period. That was a true demand drop. Rarely do we see demand drops. We often see oversupply or undersupply. So surpluses and shortage of, of the suppliers. But in the 80s, that was an adjustment to energy. And we went through a, a conservation period where cars got smaller, cars got lighter, homes got more uh, energy efficient, air conditioners were more energy efficient, engines were more energy efficient, buildings. So in the residential, commercial, and industrial side of energy consumption, they were a number, there were a number of innovations, technologies applied that truly created a, a reduction in demand. And if you study statistics to take a curve that's moving consistently in one direction and then alter it, where it goes in the other direction like it did in the 80s, then that's a pretty major change. It doesn't look like it on this curve, but it did in the overall supply of, of energy, particularly crude oil, because most of the changes were in the demand for crude oil and the consumption of crude oil. Okay. Then if you move to number two, number two is the financial crisis of 2008. That created a demand reduction because of all the financial policies that occurred and changing wealth of the worlds as they dealt with the financial changes that had occurred. And that triggered with Lehman Brothers going bankrupt. That started that uh, financial crisis. And so as a result, that is a true drop in demand also. So if you look at the lower part of the curve, one of the things I wanted to see, since that curve is energy, total energy, I wanted to see what it did to crude oil. Since I'm in the supply side of the business, since price is really critical to me and making investments, I needed to know as, uh, as these changes occurred, what, what effect was that going to have on crude oil demand? So the curve you see at the bottom is just crude oil demanded 
by the population, which is roughly 30%. It used to be 50% of the energy mix, but now it's about 31% of the energy mix. You can see over time that that's kind of grown with population also, but just not at the same rate because there's other parts of the energy mix. So now I want to draw your attention to uh, the circle number three. That's where we are today. That's what we're going to talk about next is what happens when the, pri when the demand dropped like it did, and then when is it going to come back to pre-pandemic rates, both in demand and in price. So I want, to, I want to focus on that. And then this is where you can project. If you look at the curve projecting over 38 billion barrels, is if you divide it by 365, kinds of comes out to about 108, 109 million barrels a day is what's required. So that, that's consistent with what we expect. Okay, so that completes the total energy outlook part of it. I just wanted to give you some foundation in that area so that you can have a feel for what we're, what we're going to talk about next and see if it makes sense. Okay, so we're on the little picture, and I have a favorite saying that it's not mine, but I got it from the book called Freakonomics, which is was written by Jason Dubner. And uh, what I like to use is that one of their saying, it's in the preface part of it, and it's real, they, have, they came up with four ways to look at big data. And one of the ways that I think is most appropriate is knowing what to measure and how to measure it makes something that's very complicated, much less so. And what I'm trying to do and what I'm going to continue to try to do is make this less complicated. And the way we're going to make it less complicated is you have demand, price, supply, and then a business cycle. And you have major price demand, uh, demand, price, supply, business cycles, and you have minor. What we're going to talk about now, if you noticed on that slide that we were had, which was uh, section three, it's a pretty short term uh, change or disequilibrium. So now we're going to talk about why that did. All right, so the, lo the little picture is that there are constantly disruptions in the oil markets for a variety of reasons over time. And we just have to constantly deal with that. COVID, which came charging in in February of 2020, we knew about it beforehand. I didn't know about it, but people knew about it. And But it didn't really hit my screen until late January, early February. And then it really rocked my world and rocked the world of most people that are in the crude oil supply side of the business by governments coming in and making changes to the way humans behave. And one of those big changes were the stay at home policies and the social distancing that we all had to figure out. So as everybody tried to figure out what to do, how to do it, what happened is people stopped doing things. And therefore, there was a tremendous drop in the demand for crude oil because there was a tremendous drop in the demand for transportation. And the fuels power airplanes, boats, trains, cars, trucks, every conceivable uh, vehicle that moves people around that has a combustion engine in it was affected because they weren't working. So therefore, they weren't buying fuel. So that meant that on the transportation side, refiners were not being asked to make as much fuel and refiners were not asking producers to deliver as much fuel. So the whole system backed up from the gas pump, I'm using it as an example, but however you fueled whatever vehicle you were, it all backed up from that. And it happened in sudden suddenness. It happened as quickly as anything can happen. And it, and it like I say, rocked the industry to the point where Many companies were totally unprepared. We're, we're prepared for price changes, but we're not prepared for these price changes that cycle down like they did in a very short period of time. So let's just go to the first slide, please, or the next slide, please. This is the world oil consumption and production. And it's from 2015 forward to 2020. One, And so you can see what I have circled there with the number one 
that's that's the effect of what the stay at home policies had in the social distancing and and that's the effect that it had on the transportation world, which in turn had an effect on refiners and had an effect on producers. Now, since producers sell to refiners, they are the buyers and producers are the sellers. So the buyers don't need as much. So that means the sellers can't sell as much. Now the production didn't go away. The production was still there. We were producing an, on a global basis at about 101 million barrels of oil per day. And that is now down in the 90 million barrels a day range. It got to as low as 84 million in April, but it's back up to the 93, 94 million barrels a day just through 2020. So you can see that in this curve. You can see that as you look at 2020 and you look at Q1 and then Q2 and Q3, you can see a very sharp drop in consumption first and then a very sharp drop in production second because it took a while for the production system to stop all the wheels from turning and, and basically stop producing as much oil. And then you can see that on the consumption, it came back a lot sharper and production is coming back slower, but it is definitely coming back. And the, this forecast, since we're only in the third quarter, or we're actually in the fourth quarter of, of 2020, this forecast is for production and consumption to meet sometime around the third or fourth quarter of 2021. But if you look above that curve, I have an arrow. And if I were just doing a least squares fit for the data from 2015 forward, the projection for demand and supply would be higher than what this particular graph shows that the uh, production and, and consumption is going to come back. Uh, now I want you to also drop down to circle two and what that is, that's the oil that went into storage. So while the system was shutting down where production was being curtailed and refiners were being uh, not being asked to make as much product, a lot of oil went into storage. But then if you look in the following two quarters, oil's coming back out of storage. So this is what the current situation is, and you can see it's already rebounding. We're up to about 98 million barrels of oil per day, and which means that we're coming back faster than I had envisioned initially. So this is the this is the model we're, we're looking at. And if you go to the next slide, this is a closer look at it to show production was coming in at 101-ish, and then it declined down to 90, oh, 88 million, and then it's it's climbing back up in 2021 to be sort of near where we are. And I don't disagree with that at all. I think that's exactly where we are. And the, and the reason is that people want to get out, they want to travel, everyone's anxious to get back. And so human behavior, because they are the consumers, human behavior is what's going to actually pull up the demand for fuels of all sort and get us back to a pre-pandemic rate. So let's just go to the next slide, please. What we're looking at here, we're going to go from a macro, which we've been talking about, which is the world energy, to a micro, which is just the U.S. So the U.S. typically brings into a refinery, all the refineries, about 17 and a half million barrels of oil per day. It generally makes about 20 million barrels a day of products. The difference between the crude oil that comes in at 17 and a half and the 20 million barrels a day of products is the natural gas liquids that come in, which are your ethane, propane, butane, natural gasolines that all come off of gas or all come off of the refining process. So natural gas liquids are an important part of this mix. But what I did on this slide is I took 2019 and I said on the top, says output. That's what's coming out of the refineries. And you can see for all of 2009, there was a little bit of decline going from January to December, but relatively speaking, it's uh, pretty steady. Then if you drop down to the green curve, you can see that's what's going into the refineries. And this is what buyers are buying from producers. And you can see that that's about 17 and a half million barrels of oil per day going into the refineries. And then again, it's ups and downs. Uh, a lot of it's tied to when they make gasoline, when they don't, how much is in storage, what they see in the future, what they're willing to pay. There's a lot of 
variables that go into it, but it's basically when a buyer meets a seller, that's a transaction. And again, you can see the input it was declining with the output. Then you can look at the price. This is the price that was being paid to producers by the refiners. And again, slight downward trend, but fairly consistent, fairly consistent in the $55 to $60 range going forward. And then we came into January and February and, and we had that huge decline. So again, I've taken a circle in the price, which shows you, I'm gonna have to get on this other graph because I, there's something on my screen. All right. So when you look at that graph, you come out to the low point was April of 2020. And I'm showing here that it got down to about $18 a barrel. There are actually much lower prices. Uh, we at this company received $11 a barrel for April production. Uh, this is an average price that you're seeing in this curve, but the real price that came in here was about $11 a barrel. We can't survive on $11 a barrel. No one can survive on $11 a barrel. So there was a lot of adjustments and you can, you can imagine the amount of change that occurred in the producing side of the industry. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the tail of woe, but it was devastating. He wiped out wealth because everybody had valued the reserves at $55 a barrel and the reserves of the oil in the ground. Everyone had valued the, the uh, uh, production they were going to have, the revenue they have looking for and forecasting because everybody does budgets and forward looks and all that. When I worked for Conoco back in the late 70s, early 80s, I was on a long range planning committee. And the number one thing we did at Conoco and the long range planning committee was to tell the company what revenue was going to look like for the next five years. And to do that, we had to figure out what production was going to be and what the price of oil was going to be. So 40 years ago, same problem as we have today. What's the price of oil going to be into the future? We have to make that same decision today. And everybody in the supply business has to make that decision. Now, while this is going on and there's so much devastation going on in the supply side, the rest of the world is just staying at home, adjusting to their schedules, but they have plenty of energy, they have plenty of electricity, they have plenty of heat. So they're not really aware of what's going on on the supply side, on the crude oil side, making fuels. But the people that are in that business, the entities, the companies that are in that business, have suffered terribly. Uh, Exxon, for example, has had three quarters in a row where it lost money. Now, Exxon's the blue chip company and the supply creation side of the business, and I don't think they had a losing quarter for years prior to that. Well, they've just been devastated. Chevron the same way. So everyone has to adjust. They had to cut the number of people. They had to cut their investment. So what happens is these low prices sow the seeds for low supply, low supply, and high prices so the seeds of a higher supply. So right now we're in the low low price side of the business and we're just not creating as much supply. So the rig count at this time last year was somewhere for, for the United States around 1200 rigs. The rigs today are around 340 rigs operating per day. So we're 25% of what the rig count used to be, which means we're drilling fewer, fewer wells, we're creating less supply. So back on this curve, you can see that the price has bounced back since April and it's in that 40 range. Now our goal is to how do we get back to 58 or somewhere between 55 and 60 and we get back in 58. And you can look up above and you can see the input to the refineries has increased slightly and you can see the output by refineries has, in complete, has increased slightly. And in, embedded in this slide is an Excel table and you look, you can look at the different components of what goes in the refinery and what comes out of the refinery and you can see how they're down. And in the case of, of gasoline, diesel, and uh, that we're down you know, 15%, 14%, 10%. But when you look at jet fuel, we're, we're down 45%. Well, jet fuel was actually down 75%. And when you tie that into what the TSA is seeing comes through the turnstiles at the airports, uh, it's it's, uh, you know, they've been operating at 25 or 30% of what they used to operate just during this whole pandemic period. Okay, so what's the future look like? Let's go to the next slide. This is the slide we're gonna sum it all up and come up with a prediction on. 
what you see here is again 2015 forward to 2022 and you see the price that we just talked about i've got an arrow showing what the price should average over that period of time which is about 58 and then i've got the price through the first three quarters of 2020. And now we're coming into the prediction side and what i said there's two parts will the price come back yes when is the other part of it so what we got here is a couple of models so first look at number one the number one in uh, 2021 that is showing the short-term energy outlook provided by the energy information administration into the future of, of 2021 so it's showing that prices will continue to improve slightly but not get to our target below it is the green and that's showing the NYMEX futures. And that's what the buyers think. That's what the, the people that are betting on the future price for the next uh, one, two or three years that are uh, willing to put money behind what they think the price is. So they're, they're showing the future price. And this is typically what buyers would pay of somewhere around 40 to $42 a barrel on the West Texas Intermediate. So neither one of those models help us achieve. So then we start speculating with what can happen. And you basically have number two, which is the curve in green above, and that shows what could happen. Prices could rise very quickly. They could get up to 58 to $60 a barrel and even higher, depending on a, a number of conditions. And one of those are that we don't, we no longer are staying at home. Uh, we no longer have restrictions on on travel, people are willing to travel, people are willing to get out and do all that different side of it. So as a result, they, they've done a model saying, okay, this is what it could be if everything went back to normal. And what they're factoring in here is that there's been no supply creation during this period of time. We have a surplus because the production of 101 million barrels a day was there, is still there. It's going to come back. But because we haven't had any uh, su new supply creation, there's not as much coming on the market. So they're seeing that there's going to be some demand pressure on the supply going over the next 12 to, to uh, 24 months. Uh, so that's an, that's another model. Then if you look at model three, that's the negative side of it. Okay? Could we see $20 a barrel again? Yes, there's no, there's no question about that. And all that would take would be one producer putting more oil on the market than the market can stay, sustain without the changes in the behavior of the humans, and then the price is, is just going to just gonna plummet. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. That just gives you some of uh, what I'm thinking is that best case. And my sense is we can get to $58 a barrel by the Q3 2021. And in order to do that, the, the current situation that uh, the humans are in, the human behavior has to change. So the stay at home policies, the social distancing will be altered because there's uh, either a cure or the, the um, uh, COVID has uh, abated and there's not as many new cases and people are panicked about it. And, and or in addition to that, there's a fiscal stimulus, fiscal stimulus, meaning that the government's going to provide money to help everybody bridge the gap over that period of time. So my reasoning behind that is that consumption is world kind of ride consumption is currently about 98 million barrels a day. And supply is about 94 million barrels a day. So there's a 4 million barrel a day gap in the current system. It, it can be made up, but there is a 4 million barrel a day gap. And then the demand is expected to increase one to two million barrels into the future over the next year because of growing at one percent per year. Uh, so demand will increase at the one percent. Supply creation, as I mentioned earlier, is off significantly, so we're not adding new additions to the supply. And then price, this is really critical in the thinking, price is always anticipatory because it's a buyer and a seller. It's tension between buyers and sellers. And if a buyer thinks that there's not enough supply to meet the demand of the refinery that they're buying for, or someone who's in the financial world is buying contracts 
with the expectation that they're going to go up, then that creates a tension in the financial system. It creates an attention in the buyer seller business, and the price is reflected by that tension. So, in the in the business cycle where demand dropped, price dropped, supply drops, we try to find the equilibrium, which is where we are right now, and it. Equilibrium is pretty short lived here. We're talking one to two months and then it's starting to recover. So demand is going up as things change. The price is going up and supply will eventually catch up, but it's it's a laggard on that. So as demand increases going into the future, like I said, it was a 98 million barrel a day, 4 million barrel a day shortfall. Uh, then over a year, we're going to add another million to it. I can make a case that we could close to 99 million to 100 million barrels a day by the end of uh, 2021. So as a result, I feel like that tent, that anticipatory pressure on the price will rise faster than the actual demand does. And so that's my case, Q3 to Q4 2021. And the good news is it's just my opinion, and but it's a hopefully an informed opinion. Now, one thing I always like to say is what can go wrong and in the world of energy supply, there's a big player, it's a cartel, it's OPEC, and now it's OPEC plus. And OPEC plus includes Russia. Uh, they are the ones that have taken a significant amount of oil off the market. The United States production has dropped two to two and a half million barrels a day. The uh, OPEC initially took 10 million barrels off the market, and now they're gradually coming back. And again, we have to take everything with a little bit of a, a grain of salt on that reporting because it's this is real time and we're, we always have historical data to look at. So there is a declaration of cooperation between OPEC and the OECD and the declaration of cooperation is amongst themselves that they'll all cooperate and adhere to the quotas that they have. And then, of course, the last thing that could if the stay at home policies continue and the travel doesn't recover. So that's my uh, presentation for today. Uh, my case is to get to 58 by Q3 to Q4 of 2021. I'm going to be optimistic and say Q3. And I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Rowe. Excellent. Thank you, Rick. So Q3 2021, best case. Hmm. <laughs> Um, so we, we have some good questions in the uh, in the uh, chat window, and um, I'm going to start with a, a question that came up early in the presentation, and that's about the uh, the total energy consumption graphic and the um, the the different types of fuel. Um, coal came up a couple times because it appeared that the demand for coal does increase again on that slope. Um, uh, why is that? We had a couple commenters say that um, that it's likely due to China and India, but I'm wondering, uh, from your perspective, what's driving that um, slight increase in coal demand? So that's it. There, it's, there's not enough fuel to make enough electricity and provide enough heat to meet the world demand for it. So until there is a replacement for coal, which is used predominantly to make electricity. And natural gas is filling the breach. Natural gas is growing and coal is declining, but that's going to be a long transition. So the forecast into the future that coal will be increasing slightly is because the users of coal will continue to use coal and it's mainly India and China. And natural gas can't grow fast enough to push coal down fast enough to make it where it's not a dominant player. And then one thing that a lot of people lose sight of is the amount of capital that's required to change from coal as a fuel to make electricity to natural gas as a fuel. It's not just, I'm gonna switch fuels. You have to lay pipelines, you have to have the source close by. A lot of it's geographic, a lot of it's regional. A lot of the coal is used where it's located. And a lot of the natural gas especially used to use where it's located because to move natural gas around on ships, you have to liquefy it. So if you don't have an abundant natural gas source nearby, then you need to make a lot of electricity because you have a lot of demand, then you're going to use coal. Yeah. Great. And 
And I know we're running close to uh, time here for cannabis to wrap up, but I wanted to ask you a question about the total world energy consumption. Uh, towards the, the future on that one, on the projection space, we've got a, a population growth, but the world energy consumption, all sources, doesn't grow at the same rate as the world population. Um, why that kind of divergence in the slopes of those out towards the future? Well, it's mainly because the new consumers are using less energy proportionally. So it takes them time to catch up and have all the products and the homes and the properties and the cars and all the things that we use. And then a lot of it is dominated by the Organization of Economic Cooperation, the 20 so company countries that belong to that. They're all the industrialized countries and they're growing. Their consumption is growing is a much smaller rate than the emerging economies. Uh, India and China and Indonesia and even South America where they're emerging that their their demand is going to be a little higher for that and they're going to use less efficient fuel sources. So the, the reason I like that barrels of oil per day all energy is that it shows that it doesn't grow at the same rate but it definitely grows in the same direction and one other thing that comes in is there's going to be efficiencies as we go further into the future and that'll again less consumption per person absolutely all right well i'm going to leave some time here for cannabis to wrap up rick thank you very much for your perspective for those of you all that um have asked for the recording and follow-up um we will be able to um post that we'll send you an email with the recording and uh thanks for joining us cannabis over to you Thank you so much, Dr. Rowe, and th thank you so much, Rick, uh, for your outstanding presentation. And thank you, you all, for attending as well. Um, your questions were great. Sorry we couldn't get out to all of them, but it's an exciting topic, and we we we're we're so grateful that you joined us. So we want to formally thank each of you for joining today's webinar. We hope the conversation was valuable. Next, we wanted to highlight a few of our professional development short courses and future webinars. As you heard from our speaker, lifelong learning and research is fundamental in preparing individuals to remain competitive in today's workforce. To support the needs of work in mechanical and petroleum engineers, UT Engineering has created an online mechanical graduate certificate in controls and a petroleum engineering graduate certificate in data analytics, specifically built for the oil and gas industry. Both of these graduate level certificates are created for degree seeking and non degree seeking students to provide them tools to optimize process and systems that you use every day. You know, perhaps you have not been in school for a while. No worries. We have streamlined the application process for working professionals. So visit our website today to learn more on our simple application process. Good leadership is always needed in tackling some of the world's biggest challenges. We at Texas Engineering Executive Education will be providing an engineering exam refresher course. This course is meant to assist engineering students near graduation and also working professionals in preparing for the fundamentals of engineering exam. Successfully completing and passing this exam is the first step for an engineer to take the path to registering as a professional engineer in the future. Also, Texas Engineering will be hosting our annual forensics conference. This annual conference brings together the base, best of academic and industry for an exciting exchange on forensics engineering. By using real world case studies such as hurricane structural failures and foundation issues, the conference focuses on lessons learned across a variety of topics. Please be sure to visit our website to learn more about these upcoming events. Next want to quickly highlight the upcoming energy related courses with pipe pipeline technology and measurements classes. If you or your organization need additional training in this area, please visit and contact our PTEX department today. Also, if you're interested in any of our online instructor led training or e learning, we're offering 25% discount on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. So you want to be sure to take advantage of this huge savings. Next, we also want to thank the three units of the Cockrell School of Engineering that helped put this wonderful program together.
Texas Engineering Executive Education works to reskill and upskill companies' current workforce, either through our master's degree programs, graduate certificates, or short courses. So if you have a need around STEM education or training, be sure to contact our department to learn more. And as you heard from our speaker today, Rick Bobigan, he's a member, our teacher in our Petroleum Extension of Texas, or PTEX. This department has been around for over 75 years, serving the oil and gas professionals, either through e-learning, publications, online, or in-person training. So we have the oil and gas training to meet your individual or company needs. And last but not least is our research relations team. This team partners with industry to solve some of the world's biggest problems in energy, water, transportation, wireless communication, and more. The Office of Research Relations works to facilitate and derive high value from research collaborations between companies and UT researchers. If your company would like to partner with the university to explore additional research opportunities, please email the Research Relations Office to initiate a discovery discussion. Three units are here to serve you and your company through education, training, and research. So feel free to contact us at any time, and we would love to collaborate on helping you reach your company's full potential. As we continue to talk in our Text Talk series, I want to make sure you're aware of our upcoming webinar. On December 4th at 1 p.m., Dr. Carolyn Seepersad will be discussing additive manufacturing and design innovation. In this talk, we will discuss design innovations such as digital anatomy models, military and aerospace applications. We hope each of you will join us for the future webinar, so mark your calendars today. If you would like to provide feedback on today's webinar or suggestions for future topics that may interest you, please include them in the survey following this presentation. Once again, we would like to thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great weekend and hook them horns.